it away, Pastor Phil. All right. Well, God bless you guys. I've been listening and just just listening and learning. Um, and just, you know, listening to the hearts of these artists that have come on before me. And, um, you know, this is wonderful because uh, it's been an amazing week for me. God has placed me in a lot of places in a very quick, uh, short period of time this week. I mean, I've, I've, I, was, I was in Skid Row last night. And then after that, at, at my church for Bible study. And then this morning, I was back on the streets. And then, and then coming here and, having, and hearing the hearts of believers. Sometimes you learn things. As a pastor, you're, you're hearing things from people a lot. You're hearing a lot of people struggling with dealing with things. And many times you're hearing people who are, who are lacking hope, even as believers, even as believers. But at the same time, this is nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. There, there, this is the reality of being a human being in Christ, still living in our sinful flesh bodies. And we have the victory, but there are times when we as brothers and sisters need to come alongside one another and, and speak truth. You know, us, flesh and blood. God is, yes, always working by his spirit. He's working in us. He's strengthening us. He's, in, he's maturing us. But there's a time when you need the touch of a brother or sister in the Lord who can come alongside you and help bear your burden and your burdens that you're dealing with. And it's interesting that you guys seem to be like part of a kind of a, like a band of brothers that know each other and, uh, and work together in this genre. And uh, that's wonderful because that, that is, there's support in that. There's strength in that. And that needs to be, that needs to be said. And the reason why is because there's, there's a lot of division within the body of Christ. And as, this, as was said just a moment ago, we're living in strange times right now. And, you know, as I'm sharing the gospel with groups of people, I'm reminding people of, of what is happening in this world around them that they may not be hearing a lot about or seeing it because they're not looking for it. And I understand that too. You know, most people have their days going, they got their lives, they're working. And if you're an artist, you're dealing with your art form and then you're dealing with a day job a lot of times or doing whatever it is that you do to, to make the ends meet. And there's a lot of things that are going on right now. And one of the things that as a pastor, I have the luxury of, of doing is I have a, the luxury of being able to look at these things during the course of the day and I, use, I usually call it raising my eyes a little higher above the horizon so I can see what's happening afar off. And um, I got to be honest with you. We are in, you know, people always ask the question, are we in the last days? We've been in the last days. We have been in the last days from the death of Christ on. And that is when the enemy has ramped up over the centuries. And we're sitting here a little over 2,000 years later on, and we're still battling. We're still battling. We're still growing spiritually. We're still having to grow through the sinful flesh, uh, our sin nature that we are dealing with in our lives, but still in obedience to Christ and his commands and walking in the truth, walking in faith. And um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by you, brothers, because I need to see people from all walks in all places all genres of the arts and things of that nature um because you know i i'm a musician myself i'm not a singer although i've been forced to sing <laughs> recently over the uh because of what i do at the la mission because I, I just can't get enough brothers to come in and work with me right now things are just really tough right now for a lot of people but you know i'm comfortable on the, on the performance stage. I have been since I was a teenager. That was just what I've always done. But what God is, is using all of us who are dealing with the arts, he's using us to speak to the people who we can speak to. Like for instance, you brothers can speak to people who I cannot speak to. And I get that, I understand that. But I'm also, I, I speak to people that you may not be able to speak to as well. That's just because of where God has placed us. 
And I just want to encourage all you artists today on, you know, and we got a small intimate group of artists today, but I want to encourage each and every one of you that speak the truth, continue to speak the truth, even through hardship. Right. I mean, we know that because, you know, it's one of those those verses that we try to hide our eyes from, you know, James chapter one, verse two, where James says, you know, in, you know, count it all joy when you're dealing with various trials. You count it all joy because what God is going to do is he's going to grow you through those trials. And that's really what the message is and all of that. And I can do a whole teaching on that. But let me get to let me get to the gospel. Because this is really something. I spoke to a man today. I, I, I was at a place where I've, I've shared the gospel or I've done music at. Uh, Fred knows about, about Abe. I think you know Abe, Fred. And um, I've done his uh, Hope in the Streets event quite a bit, me and Hector and, and the band, like a few times you now. And today I just preached. And there was a man there who I've seen him there almost every time. Every time I've been there, he with a woman have always been there. And when a preacher gets up to give the salvation message, he comes up every time as if he's never received Christ. Today, I was able to speak to him after I gave the message because this man is still struggling. You know, you guys are all probably too young to know of, or have heard of a group, a gospel quartet group, vocal group called the mighty clouds of joy this goes way back 50s 60s okay this man is one of them and he came from the christian music industry traveled around the world and he knows christ but he's not walking when i say he knows christ he knows what the gospel is he's grew up in church he's been doing ministry music his whole life yet his life does not line up with the life of a believer he is not not walking in obedience to christ he's not keeping his commands he's struggling in his in his flesh and i was able to speak to this man and confront him on the fact that i've seen you several years now a few years i've come here and you've come up every time and I was able to drill down with him in this. And what I was able to do is basically speak to him, and remind him of the truths of salvation and what salvation means. And in regards to Christ's finished work on the cross is sufficient. His death on the cross is, su is sufficient for our salvation. We put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you know, and just doing what it is that John 3.16 says and expanding on what that says, making sure that people understand what John 3.16 says without just blowing it out as a quick little verse, which happens a lot. There's a lot of deep understanding within John 3.16. And therein is, is the gospel because, and I hope that the others will hear this because it, this has been really powerful to me in my sharing recently because I'm reminding people of the things that maybe sometimes as Christians, we read through in the scriptures too quickly. We read through very quickly and not really get all of the meat and understanding of what is in those verses. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, a man who is desperately, desperately dealing with insecurity and in his own salvation, because he knows that he has a system of works and he's heard Jesus speak. And this is the reason why he comes to Jesus at night. And I said something today to the crowd of people. I said, listen, you guys know what happened. All, every one of you people know what happens when, when you meet somebody late at night in the dark. And where we were at was in the alley. I said, just add that to it. You're in a back alley somewhere at nighttime and you're meeting and to talk to somebody in secret. Y'all know what goes on in that environment. It's usually not good. But this is a man who is not only just a Pharisee, part of the Sanhedrin as well. But he is described in John chapter 3 as the teacher of the law. Jesus called him on it. He says, dude, you should know this. You should know these things I'm telling you. But Jesus is doing a beautiful job of laying out the scriptures. And he's bringing, he's talking to him about things that are earthly and the things that are spiritual. And Nicodemus isn't making the connection at all. And he says, you should know these things. And it's true. He's a Pharisee. And if you know anything about Pharisees, they commit the word to, the, to, to memory. 
That's part of their of the criteria for being in that position. But this is a man who's for some reason his heart was not completely hardened. But God was able to reach him and drew him. And it wasn't just Nicodemus. If you look carefully at the verse, if you look carefully at the verse, Nicodemus says something really, really interesting in the beginning. He says, in the beginning, of course, and then verse one, it says, now there's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So he's a high ranking, well-respected man in the community among the Jewish leaders. And the man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we. Now, in my Bible, I, I circled that word, re, we, because not many people talk about that, but Nicodemus was representing others like himself. He didn't, he didn't hang out with common folk. As a matter of fact, the common people in town were afraid of the Pharisees because they were always looking for a reason to, to persecute somebody, to judge somebody, to admonish somebody. They wanted people to rat each other out for violating the Sabbath and all those things. And that's really, and, and if you look at the Gospels, you see Jesus was constantly making them mad because they were, he was violating the Sabbath by doing something good for people, like healing people, all right? But aside from that, this rabbi says, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, he, he's referring to the fact that Jesus changed water to wine, and he did it publicly, and he used the help of the servants at that wedding. So, you know, the word went like wildfire. People were talking about this Jesus and what he was doing. People were already following him. But the gospel message was what he got to, to Nicodemus's brain at this point. Nicodemus, a man who's filled with himself. He believes that he's going to enter the kingdom of heaven because this is the issue right here. And Jesus is confronting him on this, right? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you in verse five, that unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That shook Nicodemus because Nicodemus thought he already had it, but he knew something was wrong. That's the reason why he came to him. I'm sharing this so that it, when, if people are going to hear this gospel message, they need to understand that they're not any different than Nicodemus, those who are not following. They think they're following, but they're doing something else. It's not by works that we are saved. Hallelujah. And Jesus is making sure that this is clear to this guy who does all the right works, follows the law according to his understanding of the law. Remember, the Pharisees corrupted the law. This is something that doesn't get taught a whole lot, but they corrupted the law. And that's why Jesus was so angry about them, because they took all the grace. They took God's grace, God's mercy out of the law. And they also abused his beloved chosen people. Because God's not done with the Jews, but that's for another sermon. But the point here is, is that there's unbelief in this world. And the unbelief is shedding. And the reason why it is, is because the world is getting very real right now. Now I'm going to tell you why I think that it is so important that we do this work and that you brothers continue to do what you are doing and speaking to the, the demographic that you're speaking to and speak with authority, with power. Get more of the word into you so that you're using scripture and you're backing your words with scripture and you, you speak with that authority into that realm because they need to hear this. And that is the fact that the unbelief is coming off of people because of the fact they've done everything. This world is now starting to fail people from the highest levels of industry to the lowest levels. It's failing. Now, I'm live, I'm live right here. You read, you know, we're right next to Silicon Beach. And it's just a small version of, of San Mateo and Sunnyvale and all those places out there in Northern California, man. People are getting laid off like crazy. When the Silicon Valley Bank went bust, that kicked a whole bunch of wealthy people in there behind. And our government did something they should not have done. But the point really is, is that that's where people started seeing that their wealth wasn't going to protect them. What does the word of God say? You're going you're gonna to serve man, you're going to serve man. Well, this world is serving the money and the money is failing them. And the government's getting ready to try to do something that's even going to cause our money to fail even more so. 
but we as Christians have a hope. And the message is the hope that comes from the message of the gospel of salvation, that today is the day to understand and to receive the fact that Jesus came into this world. God sent his only begotten son. His only begotten, monogenes, is, which is that, that Greek term that, that it says that it's only begotten. It explains that. So you understand in the original language, it was meant to make sure that you understand that this was something unique. Jesus Christ, something unique, different than any other man. He's God the Father. He's God the Son, the first, the second part of the person of the Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is the second person of the, of the Trinity. But he's fully God and he's fully man. And you got to go back to John chapter one to remember that this is Jesus Christ, the word. The word became flesh. Jesus was the agent of creation. It's all right there in chapter one of who Jesus Christ is. And now we understand that God sent his only begotten son into this world so that he could do something that we could not do for ourselves. He paid the price for our sin. Our sin, why is that so important? Because we can't pay it. Jesus Christ is the son of God. He's Emmanuel, God with us. So that's more than just saying the son of God, it's the son of man, the son of God. He is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. So now we get an understanding of who Jesus Christ truly is. And we can take that understanding and realize that Jesus did something extraordinary. He paid the price the consequences for our sins that we owed, but could not pay. He paid the price that he did not owe, but he paid it for us. So now you get, understand that, that, that where we get into John 3, 16, he says, God so loved the world. We're talking about God's creation here now. In general, the creation, human beings, part of all of that. He loved the world. Remember, he said that the world was good when he created the heavens and the earth. And everything in it, the fullness thereof, he said, it was good. It is good. It was very good, he said. But sin came in. And we know where that came in. Adam and Eve, the original sin. And from that part, but that point on, that sin has been imparted into each and every human being from that point. But here's the thing. The beautiful thing is, is that when in that act of introducing sin into humanity, created a perfect situation for God to create something that was unique. But it had to come through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why the prophets always pointed to a savior, always pointed to the redemption of mankind, starting with Israel, with the Jews. Because that's where we read all that in the Old Testament. But, you know, when you get to Isaiah 53, you start reading about Jesus. Look at Isaiah 53, and all, if Jesus is jumping out at you at that point. He was always there, and he told, he, Jesus told the, the Pharisees in John chapter 5, he says, Moses wrote of me. He didn't recognize that. So I'm laying a foundation here of the legitimacy of the power and authority given by God the Father to his son, Jesus Christ, to bring salvation. Why do we need salvation? Now here comes the rest of the John 3, 16. He gave his only son, right? God so loved the world. The greatest act of love given into this world, done in this world is God sending his only begotten son into the world. So that whoever believes in him, I'm reading the NASB version right now, and other versions will read a little differently, but it says that, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Let's stop right there. Let's make it clear here. We can't, we, we can't, we can't short play or handle or soften the blow of what that word perish means. There's a consequence for sin. Romans 3.23 says that we are all sinners, all of sin and fallen short of God's glory, right? We know that one. That's from those memory verses that we remember when we're going out and, and, and evangelizing people in the streets and in the world and all that. But when you go to Romans 6.23, it gives you a little more information on that. And it hits you square in the head when you start reading in 23. It says, for the wages of sin, tying Romans 6.3.23 to Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, right? So we understand here that word perish means something. It means death. And that death is eternal. 
And it's a righteous judgment from a righteous God. Remember, God is a just and righteous God. He's a loving God. And that's what we learn in John 3.16, because he sent his son as an act of love. And what Jesus went through, it could only be love. And thank the Lord that Jesus rose again on the third day. That was all part of the plan. But he had to go through that suffering and that humiliation, his beard being pulled out, the crown of thorns, the humiliation, being spat on, being beat, scourged. And if you ever do a history study on what scourging is, it was something that was well known by the Romans, just like crucifixion was. And it wasn't just a cat and nine whip. It was much more than that. But Jesus went through all of that. And that work was the propitiation of our sins. Now we're starting to get to the crux of it. There's going to be a price to pay for sin. If you, if you get a traffic ticket, you're going to pay a fee. You're going to pay a fine. Or you're going to go to court. You're going to get before a just judge. And he's going to ju judge you guilty. And you're going to pay the price. You do crime, you're going to do the time. You're going to go before a judge. And you're going to be judged guilty. And you're going to go and do the time. When it comes to sin, this is offense against God. We're all, Romans 3.23, we're all in it. I'm in it. And I have to remind everybody that, that Pastor Phil preaches to himself when I'm talking about this. I'm no better than anyone else out there. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So I had to come through that, jo that door. Who is Jesus Christ? I had to come through that door. So when you read 623, it's telling, it's, 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 it's nailing it down. The wages of sin is death. Because it's the price of death. Jesus Christ is, is the unblemished lamb. Remember, John the Baptist said it. Behold, the lamb of God. The lamb of God. And that goes back to the, 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 the sacrificial system that God set up with the children of Israel in the desert. But Jesus came. He died once for all. It's in the book of Romans. And it's in the book of Hebrews. Jesus died once for all. But Romans 6.23 does not end there. It doesn't end there because there's a, there's a good caveat at the end of this. Because the beginning of it says the wages of sin is death. But the second half of the verse says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hallelujah. So there is a consequence for sin. And for us human beings, Jesus Christ came into this world to pay the price of sin. And he accomplished this. He, he finished it. When he said it was finished while he was hanging on the cross before he breathed his last breath, he accomplished what God's plan was for salvation for this world. The reason why he sent his son into this world, he bowed his head and he died. And all that sin that was placed on him at that point. Now you understand why he said, Eli, Eli, lama sakbaktanai, which was talking about the fact that my father, why have you forsaken me? It's because he took on that sin. He effectively took on the burden of sin, all of that sin, past, present, and future for all mankind, so that when that sin was placed on him, it died with him. But now, enter in what Jesus said before he died on the cross. He gave Nicodemus the key to his salvation. If you believe, and the son of God, God's in the son, so that whosoever, now, you know, Nicodemus had a problem with that because he hated, the Jews hated everybody who wasn't Jewish. But he, Jesus opened up another clue to Nicodemus that he wasn't expecting. Whosoever is everybody beyond the Jews, the Gentiles. That's why Jesus turned over the money changers because they, they were put, setting up those tables and all those animals and all that money changing and selling in the, in the, it was in the court of the Gentiles. God intended for Gentiles to get saved. This is God's complete plan of salvation for the world, for everyone. That's why this gets me excited to teach this and preach this, because this is what the world needs to hear right now when people are losing their jobs. Their hours are getting cut back. It's happening to people in my own church. It's affecting the church. We're not a big church. We got a faithful group of members. Families have been in this church for 38 years. And I've been pastor, senior pastor since 2019. I've seen the effects of the, the decline. These are hardworking people. They're not slacking. What's happening is that the world is withdrawing right now. People are cutting back everything. Businesses are cutting back. They're laying people off. They have to. 
because our government has squandered the money that we give the government to be responsible over and use wisely. And now they're using it against us. I don't, don't get me even started on all that. But here's the thing, God, this is all part of God's plan because this world is getting set up. We have been given a hope, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm telling you, this hope is the salvation that is provided through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I could get into a whole lot of other subjects that, are, that, that give us even more so this hope. Remember that Jesus Christ said that when I go, I go to prepare a place for you. He was talking to the disciples, but he was talking to the church, the body of Christ. He's, he has already gone to prepare a place for us. He, when he rose again, he met with the disciples for that amount of days that he was still on earth before he ascended to his father. He taught them many things. He showed them things and he gave them messages of hope, but he gave them commands. So here's our role, ladies and gentlemen. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Now, this is what we're all here on Red's Room working toward, is accomplishing making disciples. Now, you remember, we got to share the gospel. Because in Mark, we talk, it, that's where that talks about it. You know, I think it's Mark uh, 15, 16, 15, 15. But the gospel needs to, must be spread around the world. I can look that up real quick. But the thing is, is that the gospel needs to be preached. It must be preached. That's our role as Christians. That's why he left us here. But we make disciples. That means that we speak to the gospel. And as they are drawn to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, now we can start helping to disciple them. We're all part of a church family. We lead them and we raise them. We answer their questions. This is one of the biggest thing I deal with in the church today. All these young people who've been disenfranchised and, and church hurt because people would not answer their questions about the scriptures. It was seen as a disrespect. Now, one of my wife and I's biggest job now is to answer those questions that young people have struggled to get answers from people in the church because people haven't done their homework. They're sitting in there listening to the sermons every week. They're sitting there with their heads shaking up and down like yes, and in their hearts and their minds are going no. And they go right back to work on Monday and forget everything that they heard on Sunday. And their kids, because kids are smart. They want to know what's going on with this. Why is my parents doing this? Is there a reason? Why are we devoting all this time? Why are we, why, why are we, we paying offerings into the church? What is all? You need to answer them. So they understand what your faith is. Where your, and this is where we fail. Another message. That's another sermon. But the gospel must be preached. It must be shared. And, and disciples must be made. And this is the reason why Jesus came into this world. Because he has a plan for us. I won't even talk about the second coming of the rapture, but these are things that are, we that are a hope for us, particularly the rapture of the church, because there's coming a point, and it's very soon, according to what I read in the scriptures, and, and many of us pastors who are studying this word and teaching, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, you got to look it up, because there's a hope of our salvation. This is what First and Second Peter, particularly First Peter, was talking to the churches about, and he was talking to five churches that were under serious persecution, serious persecution of the Romans. In the book of Revelation, chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three, same thing. Seven churches, many of them under serious persecution. Some were obedient. Two, and the rest of the, the five were struggling, and one of them may not make it because of their disobedience and the word has been was preached and they still followed paganism and feared the romans so what i'm saying ladies and gentlemen we have our present day modern examples of things like that are going on in the world what we're experiencing in this world is nothing new the difference is is that we're closer to the end now than we have ever been in church and bible history and this is the reason why for those who are under the sound of my voice today, hear this message of the gospel that God sent his son into this world to bring salvation so that you do not have to suffer the pain in a, of eternal death and hell. I got to make it plain because if I don't make it plain, you don't know what you avoid in coming to Jesus Christ. 
pastors do a disservice by not being willing to say that word hell. But I'm going to say it because I want people to hear that there is a consequence for rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord. This is an act of love, not an act of arrogance, like some people have said to me online. I, I, I get into these debates. It's not arrogant when you're talking about God, the creator of the universe. Who gave you the mouth to be able to, 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 to disrespect him. Judgment is coming. Avoid hell and death by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Reject sin. Repent. Recognize that you're a sinner. Like it says here in Romans 3.20. Recognize first that you're a sinner and that you want to repent. Repentance is something that you must rec humanly recognize. Remember, there's, there's a God's divine prerogative and action in our lives, but there's a human responsibility. You receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You put your faith in him, and then you get around believers, Christians, who know the word and are going to speak the truth to you in love. In love and not redefining the word love. Hallelujah. And then you disciple them. Bring them into the church of believers so that everybody believes and we believe the same things. We encourage and strengthen one another. That's how it all works. We, we bear one another's burdens. We admonish one another if we need to. We strengthen and, and, and uphold one another. We bring them food. We put them a little, a little gas in the car if they need it. We, we, we help them with their family situations. We do all those things as a family because we're in the body of Christ. We're in God's family now. We're part of something. That's what you want to bring people into is the family of God that he set up through his son, Jesus Christ. And it is truly a family of love. And this is what I've learned and seen in a wider picture right here on Red's Room, ladies and gentlemen, because you don't know how many thousands of people around the world are going to see this video and hear these artists. And that's my message for today. God bless you all. Hallelujah. That was absolutely fantastic. I was sitting over here the whole time just being like, amen, amen. Exactly what we were talking <laughs> But the theme of the night is definitely very clear. We're talking about Christ's return and how Jesus yeah. is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Yes, indeed. Amen. We're going to see the signs all around us. We have the word of God in front of us to give us instruction. Yep. That's our instruction book. That's right. Read it, people. Read it with your children. Read it for yourself. We must be faithful with the word. Come on, Liz. That's it. That's it. <laughs>